What is electricity? Welcome to my masterclass on electromagnetism. Our society is powered by electricity. Just have a look around. Transportation by electric cars, street lighting, mobile phones and the internet. Our homes have wall sockets to connect us with the power supply. A comfortable life without electricity is unthinkable. But what is electricity? To give an answer to that question, we go back to the four fundamental laws in nature. The first is the strong nuclear force that keeps the atoms together. Then there is the weak nuclear force, also called the van der Waals force, holding the molecules together. The gravitational force, which keeps our feet on the ground, holds the Earth in its orbit around the Sun and makes the universe stay together. And last but not least, the electromagnetic force. The weak and strong nuclear force work at very short distances. The gravitational force and the electromagnetic force act over large distances. In electrical engineering, we control the electromagnetic force. And that is rather special when you realize that we cannot control the gravitational force. The electromagnetic force has been, been discovered relatively late. In the Middle Ages, beautiful cathedrals were being built and 2000 years ago, the Romans erected impressive aqueducts. Yet, the electromagnetic force was only discovered until the 19th century. An often heard description of electricity is a flow of electrons inside a wire. This is, however, only a part of the story. The electric energy is stored in the electromagnetic field outside the wire. But electrons do play an important role. In the beginning of its discovery, electricity was assumed to be a type of liquid, and that is why today we speak of current, or in German Strom, and in French Courant. Electrical energy is transferred by the electromagnetic field. But what precisely is a field? A field is a state of the space, and a field possesses momentum, contains energy, and a field has waves. You should not try to visualize an electromagnetic field, but scientists like Ampere, Faraday and Maxwell have given us, based on experiments, the mathematical expressions to describe the electromagnetic field. And here the electrons come in. Electrons are a source for the electric field. Positive and negative electrical charges experience a force when they are placed in an electromagnetic field. A person traveling with the same speed as the electrons in the wire observes an electric field. At standstill, and the electrons are passing by, the person observes not only an electric field, but also a magnetic field. Both fields are perpendicular to another and interact continuously. Here we see the connection with Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. The Maxwell equations describe the physical processes of the electromagnetic fields in detail, but finding a solution for the mathematical equations is far from being easy. When we connect a voltage source to the two ends of a wire, the difference in potential creates an electric field that exerts a force on the free moving electrons in the material, and they start to move through the wire. At the same time, an electromagnetic field is created in the space around the conductor. For the 50 and 60 Hz power frequency, the electromagnetic field stays close to the surface of the wire. For the higher frequencies, the field is more distant from the wire, and for the very high frequencies, the field parts from the conductor and travels through space. In that case, we call the wire an antenna. However, when we consider the capacity of being the storage element for the electric field, the inductor, the storage element for the magnetic field, and the resistor taking care of the losses, we can, for low frequencies, fruitfully use linear circuit theory to model the electric phenomena. But how can a current flow through a capacitor, while a capacitor consists of two plates with an insulating medium in between? When a charged capacitor discharges, the discharge current through the conductor 
across a surface 1 and a magnetic field is present along path 1. With Ampere's law, we can calculate the magnetic field around the conductor. But when we apply Ampere's law to surface 2, that is also bound by path 1, we encounter a problem because the discharge current does not pass through surface 2 and Ampere's law tells us that there is no magnetic field present. But in reality, a magnetic field does exist. Surface 2 is also crossed by the electric field from the changing charge on the plates of the capacitor. Maxwell extended Ampere's law with an additional term to include the influence of the electric field. So not only a current through a wire, but also an electric field that changes over time can be the source for a magnetic field. Let us go back to what happens inside a conductor. The atoms have bands filled with electrons. The highest energy band that contains electrons is called the valence band. This band may be completely filled with electrons or only partially. If the band is only partially full, the electrons in the band can easily be raised to a higher energy level by an electric field and they can travel freely from one atom to another. The electric and magnetic fields that are created by the traveling electrons are perpendicular to another and together they form an electromagnetic wave traveling along the wire at a speed a bit less than the speed of light. There is a continuous energy exchange between the electric and the magnetic field component. Light is an electromagnetic wave and it is because of this energy exchange between the field components that light is able to travel through space. In electrical engineering we make fruitful use of the conducting and insulating property of materials, the storage of electromagnetic energy in capacitors and in inductive components and we make the electromagnetic force to do as we want. This is the beauty of electrical engineering and who knows, one day we might be able to do a similar thing with the gravitational force.